So we're going to get started. Um, I am excited to talk about this topic today. We are going to explore the artwork of two world-renowned Black artists um, who address themes of post-colonialism, racial identity, and environmentalism in their artworks. And we have our curator of arts education, Amber Audzema, who will be hosting this discussion. Um, and this discussion is gonna be live and interactive. So be ready to use the chat. Um, I have a few different buttons I wanna go over with you before I turn it over to Amber. Um, so today we're gonna to ask you to be looking closely, thinking deeply and asking questions about the artwork that we're showing you today. Um, so when you see this magnifying glass, that's kind of a cue to take a closer look and we're gonna be asking you what you see. Um, so please feel free to use the chat there um, and I'll go over one more setting with the chat in just a minute. Um, when you see this thought bubble, um, we're asking you, what are you wondering about? What thoughts do you have? What questions do you have? We wanna hear those in the chat. Um, and then that icon for the chat button in Zoom. I'm sure we're all very familiar with that, but you can find that in your Zoom toolbar. Um, so one more thing about our chat is in, once you open the chat, um, you should see a setting where it says two. Make sure you change that to all panelists and attendees. Um, Amber and I are the panelists and we wanna hear your thoughts, but I'm sure the other folks who are um, joining us today wanna to see those too. So um, that if you change that setting, then everyone will be able to see. Um, so with no further ado, I will turn it over to Amber. Hello, thank you, Carly. Um, let me see if, okay, I think I can see me. So I think there we go. Um, and I'm gonna screen share my screen. And um, first of all, I wanna talk a little bit about what colonialism is or was and what post-colonialism is and how we look at that through artwork. So here we have a, an image of um, Hispaniola, the island that ho has both the countries of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And I'm just going to use this a little bit as an example to um, illustrate what happens after colonialism. Um, so these two countries have a long history of colonialism. Um, on the Haiti side, they were colonized by the French and on the Dominican Republic side, um, they were colonized by the Spanish. So and you can see these numbers here. This is um, in the end of the 18th century, there were about 40,000 white land owners, 25,000 black or interracial freedmen and 60,000 slaves in the Spanish colony of the Dominican Republic. And on the other side, there were 30,000 white land owners, 27,000 freedmen and 500,000 black slaves. So um, it was really not quite equal in a, a lot of ways right from the get-go. There are also some other complications to this history of colonization. Um, on the Dominican Republic side uh, is kind of really lush um, and then there's kind of a mountain range that blocks a lot of the rain to Haiti. But there's also um, how the countries were decolonized when the colonizers left, there's kind of a slow pull out from the Dominican Republic side where on the Haiti side, um, it was pretty violent um, uprising that led to the freedom of the Haitian people and um, a pretty abrupt leaving uh, of the French colonizers. Um, and a couple of real quick notes I have there. So the French Revolution is happening in the late, in the 1790s. And so um, the, the colonial slaves revolted at that time period. And um, in 1804, uh, they were able to declare uh, independence and it was Haiti is the first sovereign black uh, republic. Um, now they weren't be able to establish until the country or the Dominican Republic until 1844 so it, it happened a, a little bit differently. 
And there's strife from um, all of the European countries and even between the two sides of this island. And it's pretty complex and I'm definitely not getting into it super deeply, um, but just kind of wanted to touch upon that. Um, not only did France um, leave all of a sudden, but while they were there as colonizers, um, they used up a lot of the natural resources. So there um, were some things that were being produced from Haiti, uh, coffee, sugar, um, and uh, I guess those are the two main main products are coffee and, and sugar. And I, um, I'm not 100% sure if those are still produced there or not, but uh, they actually had to pay France to um, receive the diplomatic recognition um, when they're vaulted. So um, I just a quick introduce, introduction to the colonialism of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And then um, I wanted to, to look at the idea of post-colonial art. So this is art that is produced in response to the aftermath of colonial rule. So it's frequently addressing those issues of national and cultural identity and race and ethnicity and kind of what happens to the people that are left behind um, when a, a colony, a country who colonizes another country pulls out. And here is an example of some artwork related to the um, colonization of Caribbean islands. So this is Philip Thomas's um, Pimper's Paradise or the Terra Nova Nights edition. And in the background we see, um, this is actually a pretty common wallpaper uh, that shows what people were doing around this time. Um, and we see some tension between the, the white colonizers and we have some um, of the darker figures that kind of symbolize or represent the black people uh, that were slaves of the colonizers at one point. So some of them are interacting with the white people and perhaps wanting to be like them, um, but uh, there are still a lot of evidence of a lot of the negative treatment that they experienced. And then up front in the foreground, we have this uh, mannequin. Uh, this is a, um, like a dressmaker's dummy. And we see the, the camo, the camouflage, which is a reference to, the, to a military, um, but it is bedecked with jewels. So perhaps a reference to how um, wars make money. And in war, a lot of times there's a lot of violence and death. So just a couple of, uh, or just one example of how artwork can directly address what happened in during the colonization period. So that being kept in mind, let's look at um, one of our new pieces and uh, keeping in mind that the two images that we're going to zoom in on today reference post-colonialism in some way. So I am going to stop my share and I'm going to highlight um, we're going to highlight uh, Carly once I can find her up here. Spotlight video. And I'm going to ask you in the chat to let me know, let us know what it is you are seeing. And that can be anything from a, um, a list of materials or colors or shapes or lines or textures or something that it reminds you of. Just let us know what you see. And Carly's going to take some time to do some close ups and time to take a step back. I know we have some people watching on Facebook Live, so we'll um, give you some time too. Um, Kylie says a rug. Uh, Andy says the gold color makes it feel precious. And Eve sees bottle caps. Uh, 
Valerie is seeing a repetitive pattern. Susan is seeing a uh, reference to cloth or quilt. Megan says shapes that look like flags. Eve says many different colors. Doris says her first response is a coat of many colors. And the second is multiple pieces, metallic in color, um, but only in certain areas. Linda says it looks like a, there's a brick wall under stress. Interesting. Um, noticing Ellen Atsui's work of reused metal. Oh, a question. Uh, well, somebody wonders, are they cigarette wrappers? We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, it reminds me of the wallpaper background in the previous image. Mm, nice connection. Lene says many small pieces making a whole piece. Karen, um, I think she knows the answer to that question. I uh, asked, yeah. so repurpose labels from many, many bottles of wine and booze or, or liquor. Recycled objects. Um, Susan says the darker spots look like a torn area or a, or a hole. Lots of like a sequined material, Adrian says. It looks dynamic, like a snapshot of fabric in motion. Um, the raised areas kind of make you think of a topographical map. There's a fluidity in the piece that contrasts to the stiffness of the bottle caps and wine labels. Oh, Megan says the torn or whole area looks like it's leaking or seeping something. Adrian says in one general area, it looks like a crowd of people. Really great observations. Um, Heidi says it reminds me of an aerial photo. Oh, Val says uh, a Klimt painting, a Gustav Klimt. Used a lot of golds in, in his work too. So I love all of these observations. Um, a lot of them are familiar to me and remind me of the original observations that I think of when I see this. Um, Susan says areas of chaos and areas of order. Hmm, that's really a astute observation. From Facebook, um, it looks like a topographical map with hills and lakes, areas of free form amidst a uh, regimental pattern. Yeah, so Karen is seeing those, those kind of gold pieces. Um, gold and kind of a bronze are all the same shape and size and color creating a pattern. But then we have some free form with the different shapes and colors. I'm assuming we just had our first comment from Facebook and there is a delay on Facebook. So I'm trying to get, um, give a little bit of time because I'm assuming a few more will be coming in. But we can also, you can, you can continue to uh, think about what it, um, what you see, tiny tires that men wear. Interesting. Um, but now let's also shift to um, some questions. What do you wonder about this piece? Anything spark your curiosity? And we had one question already um, that's kind of been answered, right? Um, is it made from cigarette packs? And it's not. Um, and Karen Adado mentioned it's um, caps and labels from liquor bottles and beer. Um, where did the materials come from, Eve said, and Linda wonders if it tells a story. Is this a narrative piece of artwork? Ooh, very good questions. One I can answer, where did the materials come from? Well, originally, um, this artist started out gathering um, trash 
from the ground that people discarded. Now he's so popular that he and his team are able to get the, this material from uh, recycling plants. Um, Claudia says it's, it looks extremely labor intensive. And Maureen wonders, how are they attached to each other? And I can say that it is pretty labor intensive, um, but this artist has a, a studio full of assistants as many really popular artists do. And how they are attached to one another. Um, if you get real close without touching, of course, you can see that there are wires, little wires that connect each individual piece as Carly is kind of showing. Wonder what the artist was thinking and feeling when he created this. Um, in Facebook, Emily says, honestly, it looks like a wall with a hole blasted into it, which is, you know, a very um, visceral kind of image, right? Well, and I can say that all these observations, a lot of them are um, some of the things that the artist El Anatsui lists as inspiration for the piece. So he or his artwork in general. I wonder if it has a descriptive name. And Doris says there's obviously a message that recycling of discarded materials can result in beauty but wondering what else he is trying to tell us. Um, and Andrea is noticing the chain mail effect allows for the flexibility. That's a really good observation. So Elena Tsui has mentioned that textiles influence him. He is from Ghana and works and lives in Nigeria. And Kylie says, um, Tiny ties, okay, that does make a lot more sense. Tiny tie ties that men wear, I see. That shape kind of is, um, looks like a tie that someone would wear. Thank you for explaining that. Um, so I think I am going to, why the choice to shape rather than hang it flat against the wall? That's a really um, good question. So I think I'm going to take the spotlight off Carly. There we go. Um, I'm going to screen share back to the PowerPoint. And here's a close up view of the, um, the wires that connect all of the pieces and the bottle caps. You don't need to play the video though. But here's some information about the artist, Alan Atsui. So he's born in Ghana and lives in Nigeria. He is um, a professor of art at the University of Nigeria. He's at emeritus status now. He's um, in his 80s, I believe. And he mentioned that the Ghanaian and African history and the kente and adrinkle cloths um, are a big inspiration for him. Uh, he's mentioned in videos that he is um, inspired by the language and the symbolism of these things. Um, and then he's also in inspired by the effects of colonialism and environmentalism and consumerism. So let me go back to, um, I want to make sure, okay. Let me go back just one slide, actually perhaps a couple. And ask you this question. And you know what? I think Carly already set this up in a, a really great way for me and I'm going out of order. How do you interpret the title? The title is the new, new World Map. 
by Alan Atsui. And he has um, an interest in language, like I mentioned, and um, textile history and the history of African art. Um, and there is this wonderful quote here, art is a reflection on life. Life isn't something we can cut and fix. It's always in a state of flux. So perhaps Valerie, that answers your question a little bit as to why he doesn't um, hang this flat against the wall. Um, it's It's gotta be in flux. So in the chat, if you have uh, any thoughts, uh, let us know what this new world map, the title of new world map, what does that mean to you? And perhaps that little bit of a historical context about the artist Elena Tsui and his life um, might give you some information on that as well. Any thoughts? It does look like a map. It's uh, like a textured globe, Adrian said. And many of you mentioned that kind of an aerial view or a, uh, an idea of a map um, with the, the geographical raised portions that indicate um, elevation. Anything else that new world map might mean to you? Yeah, prize to the person who's that aerial view. Good job. Um, Andrew says to the colonizers, it's a new world, but not to the indigenous population. So Andrea is referencing um, the idea of the new world, which came about when um, Europeans came to the Americas and called it the new world. Now, there's already people living here, so it's not the new world to them, as she's mentioning. Why do you think he would call it the New World Map? He made it in 2009. And it did become a whole new world for uh, the native population once the colonizers left, or the fact that the colonization, um, the colonizers didn't leave the New World, right? Um, to a degree, I mean, it eventually became not under British rule, but. Um, the colorful areas perhaps seem urban, and the big dark areas are um, could be a environmental damage uh, or an oil spill, perhaps, I Heidi says. Um, it's a new way to view the world, Susan said, perhaps. Um, and uh, Andrea says they, the colonizers left all their junk um, and, and perhaps the liquor labels. Um, Judy says, because he makes these in sections that can be reassembled in different combinations, it emphasizes his idea that the world is in flux and always changing. That's a good uh, point, Judy. Yeah, the, these are made in sections. Um, so his uh, studio assistants will make sections and then he comes and helps decide um, how to put them all together. So it is always in flux and there's many different hands uh, working for it too. Yeah, so uh, um, you can think about that too. What what do you think the material means in this piece, those liquor labels and caps? And I don't, I don't know if it was easy to see Andrea saying it's questioning the refuse that ruins the environment. And the choice of material seems to suggest that he feels the new world is dominated by alcohol consumption, which is a tool that many colonizers use to subvert or control native populations. Sure. And Linda says some parts seem ordered and some um, in disarray. Sue mentions that colonizers Drew the natives into turmoil and turned to alcoholism. And how would you relate to this to, we got the idea of the new world being uh, perhaps the United States or the Americas, um, but how about what is happening, what happened um, in Ghana and Nigeria and in Africa? 
Um, and liquor was it introduced by the coloners, colon, colonizers, Maureen, thank you. Um, Adrian says, it reminds me a bit of the Wally movie. We have partially destroyed the earth, but there could be a chance to save it. I like that message of, of hope, Adrian. And you might not um, have been able to see it in the close-ups, but the liquor labels are um, written in English. And um, I think I've seen, saw some French in there as well. Um, but no, th these are all materials collected in Africa. Um, but uh, none of the languages are traditional, traditionally spoken African languages. But I think Maureen kind of um, touched on that too. It's in general, liquor was introduced um, by the colonizers, both in the New World and in Africa. Okay. Let me see, I have some notes here. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. Um, I do want to mention that this is this piece is in our new Welcome Center, and we have another piece by another African artist, Yinka Shonobari. Um, well, he's African British, Nigerian British, um, that also addresses post-colonialism in a few different ways. And there um, is a handout right now that highlights Black sculptors, the Black sculptors that we have in our collection, which um, I will admit is not a huge number, um, but we are starting to grow that number. And that's available at the information desk and the, um, the ticket taking desk too, for another week or so probably. Um, another comment, the gold and tan labels maybe represent the colonizers who owned most of the land and held the power. And then the multiple colors be, are the indigenous people um, who are forced into villages and in poorer conditions. And a question of what is the size of this piece? And I don't have the actual dimensions um, in front of me, but uh, it is pretty large. It does cover most of the wall that it is on. Um, and people who are standing next to it go to uh, around, um, I want to say these granite pieces are either five foot, about five foot. So your face is about here. I hope that helps. <laughs> okay. So next we'll move to another image um, of artwork that it has been at Meyer Gardens for some time. Um, and, uh, and perhaps you've passed them as, as you've been here and perhaps you've taken some time to look at them. But um, I'll ask for you to take a second to look at this image, the still image. And then I'm also going to, um, this, is, this was taken in warmer weather and this is actually taken from behind where you would view it, um, looking out into the path. And then um, I'll move to a video here. This was just taken uh, recently. So again, the question is, what do you see? Adrian says it looks like a young palm tree. These are actually two sculptures by the same artist. Notice that anything on the close up? Joanna says recycled tires forming a tropical plant, perhaps. Yes, and that is the medium is the material is um, tires, old recycled tires. Giant Indian corn, Valerie says. Uh, Doris says, uh, wonder a variety of textures and shapes. And I can just move to the still here. So yes, good observation. Um, there is a variety of textures and shapes. Repurposed tires and rubber, yes. 
reminds you of a funky pineapple. I like that. Anything else you notice? And I can say that both of the, the artists work that we're looking at today, Shakaya Booker and Ellen Atsui, their work is non-representational, which means it, does, it isn't meant to look like anything, one thing in particular. Um, or you could say that Anatsui is, is uh, highly abstracted, um, but you can certainly, it can certainly remind you of, of lots of things. Dora says some of the shapes reflect animal shapes, perhaps a horse snout or wings. Hmm. Valerie says it reminds her of African dancers. And Judy wonders, are the two pieces uh, meant to go side by side? And Linda says dancing, okay. Karen says a, a, a sense of freedom of movement. And yes, these two are meant to go side by side. And that leads us to what do you wonder? So you can, you can continue to let us know what you see and or what you wonder. From Facebook, you get the sense of freedom and movement. Um, Charlie wonders which one is rendezvous and which is urban excursion. Oh, Judy wonders if it, there's some type of couple. And Charlie, I can admit that I'm not sure which one is rendezvous and which one is urban excursion. I'm always seeing them at various different angles and I'm not sure which one is which, but they're very much related. Um, Adrian wonders if they are twins or related elements. Kylie kind of sees giraffes. Interesting. And Valerie wonders how the pieces are put together. And I can say that Shakaya Booker is very hands on um, and wears the coveralls, does some welding, and um, I'm not exactly sure how they're adhered, but uh, it is pretty intense work from what I've read. Okay, well, let me give you some historical context. And oh, Sue makes a good point. The names kind of infer a flirtation between the two and, and the fact that they are meant to be displayed together, um, urban excursion and rendezvous. And let's talk about that in just a second here. How do you interpret those uh, titles? Rendezvous and urban excursion. What do those titles make you think of? Ooh. That's an interest, a good observation. Judy is noticing that the loops at the bottom are very orderly and they form a pattern. And that's very different from the tops, don't they? Um, Lone wonders what the sharp points and bristles are saying. How might you interpret that? Soon notice of that too. So kind of like they're wriggling free from their constraints. Ah, Susan says um, rendezvous and urban excursion. Those are things that people do. Okay, so a rendezvous is a French, rendezvous is a French term, which means meeting, a meeting of one or two or more people. Um, and Dora says the title makes me think of going with a friend to explore a cityscape. I like that you got the um, connection there. Adrian says maybe it's a tense relationship. I, what makes you think that? Oh, Adrian says because of the bristles. Okay. An urban excursion. Urban means um, like a, a city somewhere densely populated. An excursion is a, an adventure or a, a going out, so to speak. I hadn't really thought about um, those bristles in that way. So I appreciate the insight that you guys are bringing. A 
Okay. Well, let me give you some more information. It makes you focus on the motion of the pieces. There is so much motion in these pieces. Here's a question. Did you think about any of these things when you looked at it? Black women's hairstyles, um, African tribal masks or African scarification. And if you didn't think of them when you look at that, looked at them, do you see a potential connection now? And I can give you some more information about Shakaya Booker. She grew up in Newark, New Jersey, so just across from New York City. So she's familiar with urban landscapes. And she received, a, um, I have this here. Judy says, so, yes, the, the hair in particular. And here is an image of Shakaya Booker. So she has a, a she has a bachelor's from of sociology from Rutgers. So she is definitely in um, into the study of of people and how people interact in different um, settings. And then her her master's degree is in sculpture and painting. Uh, but she originally went to art school to focus on wearable art. So when she is in the studio working on her art, she is in coveralls and she's got her welding um, tools and she's going to town. But anytime you see her uh, present or um, at an exhibition opening, she is wearing these elaborate fabric headdresses. And so she is often inspired by themes of environmentalism, identity, and race. And sometimes that's gender identity, sometimes that's racial identity. So her artwork is non-representational, as I mentioned, and she does use these recycled tires and steel, but she still makes wearable art for her uh, headdresses. And um, here's a great quote from her. My intention is to translate materials into imagery that will stimulate people to consider themselves as a part of their environment, as one piece of a larger whole. And um, so, um, and I, yeah, environmentalism was on that list too. So now that we, we talked about a little bit of the, the context, the historical context that she's inspired by, does that change how you interpret these pieces? And I certainly do, when people say um, tropical plants, I certainly see that, absolutely. I think that's an easy first connection. And I have some information. Um, the, they, yeah, Susan says they absolutely look like maybe African masks now. So the, the use of tires, well, here's the other question I have to ask. What do you think this has to do with post-colonialism? It's a little bit more of a stretch than the Anatsui pieces, but, um, what kind of issues might she be bringing up in her artwork that relate to the post-colonialism? She is an American artist and she's working with um, materials found in America. And while rendezvous is a French term, but um, Carly says the tires make her think of a mobility um, and an idea of privilege and, and lack thereof. So that can have to do with disability, physical disability. Um, rubber production, Susan mentioned, decimated so many places and perhaps that relates to colonialism. Um, and Peg says the discarded tires are bad for the environment, but she has uh, made an attempt to beautify the object, which relates to her headdresses too. Right, so she's using fabric, by the way, that is also recycled, that has been discarded. So she's always made connections to this idea of environmentalism. 
And um, something that's often not thought of when we're thinking about environmentalism is the disparity between those who have um, wealth and power um, and how they do not have to deal with as many, many issues of uh, environmental disasters than people of, that don't have as much wealth, which is disproportionately um, we see people of color who are disproportionately affected in that way. As Judy said, I think of modern urban totems. So kind of relating to the tribal mask um, inspiration there. So Adrian says expeditions of colonizing people look for materials that they don't have in their own region. So they are using that, those natural resources up, yeah. And Joanna says, a globalization uh, pro progress progresses, as globalizations progress, um, tires and mobility are a double-edged sword. They offer opportunity, but at a cost. That's really insightful. Thank you for sharing. Any other thoughts about this piece? Karen says, um, unlike a lot of our other sculptures, these are displayed on a a bed of hard gray stones, good point, um, rather than soft, colorful plants. And was that to bring up more urban vibes? Uh, she's wondering. And yes, Karen, I believe so. I, um, all of the surroundings of our sculptures very intentionally uh, placed. So yes, it's kind of reminds us of gravel and where tires might be placed. So good observation. I will say too, Amber, that the um, smell of the tires in the mm -hmm. summer is also a reference to that manufacturing aspect and the effect on the environment because it is pretty strong if you're smelling for it anyways in the heat. Yeah, thank you, Carly. So that adds another um, one of our senses when you're experience this, experiencing this in person, right? And you definitely, when you smell hot rubber, <laughs> it, uh, you can smell the chemical process, certainly. Um, Sue says it definitely has an environmental message. And I'll also mention, um, she has mentioned before too, that tires uh, is our, uh, a medium that she likes because the different tone range of the black tires remind her of the variety of hues um, found in black skin. So there is definitely a connection between um, black skin tone, uh, black hair, and um, the, the relationship with the colonized and the colonizer, as well as that environmental message, absolutely. Okay, and I think so that I believe was our last image. Um, I want to uh, thank everyone so much for the, your participation today. I really enjoyed this discussion. Um, and something to take away from this is when you look at artwork in general, you can consider the time period and the historical context in which the artwork was created. And as an art historian, um, my heart is full when I see people do that. Um, and and think, ask yourself this question, what perspective is being represented in these artwork and whose perspectives might be left out? Um, and then Carly put in our chat a link for donations if you um, are able and would like to donate, uh, please feel free. We also have a spot on the website for that at any time. And you can um, specify that your donation goes to the education programming. And we have a feedback doc for you, a Google doc. Um, thank you all for participating. And note that our next Zooming in will be on March 25th. And we'll be taking a look at some of the, the women sculptors of Meyer Gardens.